ಹಲೋ ಹಲೋ ಕೇಳಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದೆಯಾ ಓಕೆ ಆಯ್ತು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಐ ಎಮ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶಶಿಕಲಾ ಹಿಯರ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಟಾಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಬ್ಲೀಡಿಂಗ್ ಡಿಸಾರ್ಡರ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಯು ಮೇ ಸೇ ಹೆಮೊರೇಜಿಕ್ ಡಯಾಸಿಸ್ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ದಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯುಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ದ ಮೆಡಿಕಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಫ್ರೆಟರ್ನಿಟಿ ಶುಡ್ ನೋ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೊ ದರ್ ಆರ್ ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ಕಾಸಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಬ್ಲೀಡಿಂಗ್ ಬಟ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಅಸರ್ಟನ್ as to what is that disease or the etiology pathogenesis of that particular cause for bleeding uh i'll tell you some important uh, uh, uh incidents also case uh, histories you know how these people uh, present with so bleeding disorders and before we deal with bleeding, bleeding disorders there is something that homework that you people have to do what is this homework so whatever your brain has in the memory about hemostasis what is hemostasis you know the normally what happens all of us would have had some or the other injury okay you can all remember the cut wound or whatever you had so what is the observation even if probably you didn't have you have seen others so an injury they by mistake you know a knife or a blade we have a cut what happens there immediately from the site of injury it starts bleeding blood oozes out what happens if you are just seeing there after a few minutes the blood flow gradually see comes down and it stops what do we see there we say blood has clotted it stops so the mechanism of this how the blood clot how bleeding stops and how the blood volume uh, not the blood volume how this is maintained is hemostasis homeostasis is a fluid balance you know we have spoken about edema and all that this is hemostasis you know to know how the blood gets clotted so what is that clotting mechanism what is the fibrinolytic mechanism and all so you have learnt in physiology please recollect that then you can understand this better but i do have one or two slides which talk about it so bleeding disorders are a group of disorders which are characterized by defective hemostasis so normally you have learnt in physiology in pathology you learn what is abnormal so away from the normal so this is due to what are the causes then due to vascular abnormality due to platelet abnormality due to disorder of coagulation factors or hemorrhagic diathesis is due to fibrinolytic defect or combination of 1 2 3 4 any combination combination of all these where do we see that in disseminated intravascular sorry for that disseminated intravascular coagulation we must have heard you know many uh, women during labor post delivery they bleed so much they bleed to death so one cause could be postpartum hemorrhage we say that could be due to dic that is disseminated intravascular coagulation so this is what i was talking about the hemostasis which you have learnt in physiology let me just take a minute to go through this so blood vessel injury or any injury at any site i told you the bleeding stops why there is a neural mechanism where the blood vessel constricts so it reduces the blood flow then the platelets aggregate at the site of injury so they form a primary hemostatic plug in the blood vessel so platelet activation then forms a stable plug hemostatic plug then tissue factors that activate the coagulation cascade there is fibrin that is formed so a stable hemostatic plug is formed all these lead to stopping of hemorrhage or bleeding at that time 
See, bleeding disorders are a group of disorders characterized by defective hemostasis with abnormal bleeding. So, what are the different types of bleeding? This bleeding could be spontaneous. Spontaneously, there may be bleeding. You must have seen many hypertensives who will have intracranial hemorrhage, hemorrhage in the brain. They may survive, they may die. Why? That's a spontaneous bleeding. What happens in the brain? So, there is an etiology and pathogenesis there, but spontaneously, we will not know when it bleeds. So, maybe the hypertension is not under control and all that. So, that is, it could be spontaneous in the form of small hemorrhages into the skin or mucous membrane or there may be extensive or excessive internal bleeding following trivial trauma or surgical procedures. See, petechiae must have seen small in many patients with viral uh, fever. So, one viral fever, let us remember, is dengue caused by dengue virus, you know. Davangiri is endemic for that. It is Egyptia, is a mosquito which spreads this. So, when platelets, the number of platelets decrease, when there is thrombocytopenia, it all depends what is the count. Some people may not bleed till the count is 10,000. Others start bleeding even when it is 50,000. Okay, we may see small red spots on the skin and the mucous membrane. So, that is petechiae. See how they are? This is dot like. Slightly larger millimeter is purpura. And if it is larger than that, we call it as ecchymosis. Okay, these are the clinical manifestations of bleeding disorders. So, the hemostatic mechanisms have two primary functions to promote local hemostasis at the site of injured vessel. You saw that? The first slide of hemostasis. Then, to ensure that the circulating blood remains in fluid state while in the vascular bed, that is, to prevent the occurrence of thrombosis. See, normally, when the blood is circulating in the blood vessels, does it clot? No, it's in a fluid state. If it clots, then it is abnormal. That leads to thrombosis and all that. Okay. So, these two are the mechanisms that we should remember. So, just for example, I tell you, how is the menstrual blood? It doesn't clot. Okay. The fibrinolytic mechanism is active there. If the patient complains that she is passing clots then during menstruation, then we say there is excessive bleeding. Okay, that's a fibrinolytic mechanism we talk about there, why it does not clot. The investigation of disordered vascular hemostasis. So, when we see patients with any sort of bleeding disorders, now we just spoke about petechiae, then slightly larger hemorrhage purpura and then slightly larger is ecchymosis. Otherwise, we may see larger areas of bleeding. That is, it could be in the muscle, it could be in the joint and all that. So, usually when so much of bleeding occurs, we put them under coagulation defect. Remember the causes I told you for bleeding diathesis or disorders. So, here when we talk about disorders of vascular hemostasis, it could be due to increased vascular permeability. Reduced capillary strength and failure to contract after the injury. The first mechanism, failure to contract after the injury. Test of defective vascular function. Then how do we determine? How do we know? What tests have to be done? So, bleeding time and HES capillary resistance test. See, reduced, if this is vascular, increased vascular permeability. Normally also it occurs. When does it occur? All of you had a fall? When you are children, when you, when you are a child, each one of you have fallen, right? So, which is the most common aspect, part of the body that is injured while running, jogging and, you know, playing or cycling and all that. So, knees are the ones which are injured, right? Just look at your knees probably, you know, all of you would have had one or uh, two scars also. You know, the telltale sign that you had uh, fallen and all that. So, what happens to that injury? Abrasion. The skin is injured. The epidermis is removed. 
so as you observe as you have observed experience slowly a scab forms the blood clots and the scab forms so fifth or sixth day probably must have observed you know itching sensation and uh, none of us even keep quiet when it starts itching with scratch when a scab is formed what do we do we usually try to pluck the scab what have you observed before i tell you just recollect actually you have removed the scab whether entire or in bits and pieces suddenly you have seen bleeding right as children we got scared also by the scab when you remove it bleeds because that is granulation tissue that is there at the site of injury the injury is healing by or with the formation of granulation tissue ultimately it forms a scar or collagenized collagenized tissue so it has lot of capillaries all these capillaries have increased permeability still their endothelial cells have not produced those tight junctions that's why it bleeds it's a normal phenomenon but why i gave you this example is when we talk about vascular increased vascular permeability so you have tried to remove the scab and then you have seen bleeding and after you remove the scab you see the wound there it could be red in color that's healthy healthy granulation tissue so we talk about two investigations here bleeding time and hes capillary test you've done it in first year probably but i'll just repeat this okay bleeding time so what is the normal bleeding time we say 3 to 8 minutes if the wound or any site of injury goes on bleeding then we get worried we say why is it bleeding so much right so we have to know whether it's a bleeding disorder so we have to estimate the bleeding time so what do we do for this it's a simple test based on the formation of hemostatic plus following standard incision on the volar surface of the forearm so normally what is done in the laboratories is we should never do that but still they just prick the pulp of the finger just to get the capillary blood and go on blotting the blood on a blotting paper and then count this so where else it could be done which other side the lobule of the ear even here we get capillary blood so take a lancet prick it in. so that should not be done actually how it has to be done is so on the volar aspect so incisions are made tiny incisions are made and then we have to see how long the incisions bleed okay the test is dependent on what does it tell us so this test tells us about the capillary function right so when there is injury the first mechanism hemostasis you know the capillary should contract the blood vessel should contract so if there is increased fragility of fragi fragility of the capillaries or platelets are decreased then this bleeding time is prolonged that means platelets to adhere so this determines this depends on capillary function can you see this am i blocking as well as platelet number that is count and the ability of the platelets to adhere so it depends if this test tells us about the capillary function the platelet count the blade platelet function what is the platelet function that is see adherence and aggregation adhesion and aggregation okay so this is bleeding time what is the next test so oh, this is prolonged if it if it is prolonged i, I told you 3 to 8 minutes is normal bleeding time if it gets prolonged causes thrombocytopenia what is thrombocytopenia reduction in the number of platelets what's the normal platelet count very easy to remember is 1.5 lakh to 4.5 lakh per cubic millimeter the disorders of platelet function remember this disease von willebrand's disease then vascular abnormalities as in ehlers danlos syndrome and severe deficiency of factor 5 factor 9 okay you may forget that also no problem then so bleeding time it provides us assessment of platelet count and function this is what i told you here is 2 to 8 i told you 3 to 8 so one test 
is over. I have told you how it has to be done. If it is prolonged, what are the causes also? The next is Hess capillary resistance test. We just call it as Hess test. What is done here? So this for doing this test, we need a BP apparatus. So we tie the cuff of the BP apparatus above the cubital fossa. You know how we record the BP. So we tie the BP cuff there and then increase the or raise or the pressure and keep it at a range which is between systolic and diastolic. So we know like normally when we say the normal blood pressure is 120 by 80. In between 120 80 is okay. Let's just take it as 100. So raise the pressure and leave it at 100 millimeters of mercury and mark an area of about uh, say 3 centimeters on the volar aspect, this aspect of the forearm and then see, so pressure, leave that pressure for 5 minutes, increase that pressure in the cuff, keep it at 100 and 5 minutes. After 5 minutes deflate, remove that pressure and then see how many petiche, how many those red tiny spots have appeared in that 3 centimeter normally we say that the number of petiche that appear for a person who is normal is less than 20 in number so if it increases more than 20 then we say it is abnormal the test is positive and it indicates that there is increased capillary fragility as well as thrombocytopenia so when we talk about capillary fragility, we have to know about vitamin C deficiency also, which could give a positive test. Then, hemostatic disorders are commonly due to abnormalities in platelet number, morphology or function. So we spoke about vessel vascular abnormalities and second is platelet abnormalities. I gave you an example of dengue, please remember. Certain other viral infections also present with tiny hemorrhagic spots on the skin and mucous membrane. Okay. So what are the screening tests? How do we know that platelets could be abnormal? What do we do? We look at the peripheral blood platelet count. So we do a platelet count. So there are machines now which do a platelet count. Even if the machine gives us a value of platelet count, we definitely look at the peripheral smear for the presence of platelets. So here platelets are adequate, they are all together, see these are aggregates of platelets, that is a function I told you, they usually are together. So if they are single, large and discrete, now how with COVID we are all uh, keeping the social distance, if all the platelets keep the social distance, we say is something abnormal. That is why humans also are finding it so difficult to keep apart, right? So they are all crowded. So platelets usually are seen like this in the smear then. So we look for bleeding time, you know I told you the test. Then examination of fresh blood to see the morphology. So when we look at the peripheral smear, we not only we look at the count, we look at the morphology also because we say platelets are about 2 to 4 microns in size. So if the platelet is large, okay, then we say mega platelet. So that's also abnormal. So we look for platelet count and morphology on the smear. So the special test, are the special tests I told you the platelet function, what is it? Adhesion aggregation. So special test where we determine platelet adhesion, we do platelet adhesion test, platelet aggregation test. You can just remember these two terminologies, that's all. Aggregation, adhesion test and aggregation test. What else? All these platelets have granules, whether they are functional, the, how are the granules? To look at them, we have to resort to electron microscopy and we have to measure what are the substances released by these platelet granules, but usually we don't do this. Then platelet coagulant activity is measured indirectly by prothrombin consumption test. Remember the first two, okay? So screening test for hemostasis, what are all the tests that are done? I told you about bleeding time. If we do a bleeding time, this test, it tells us about platelet function, vascular integrity. So I am repeating associated disorders are qualitative disorders of platelets. Okay, platelet function count, then von Willebrand's disease, then quantitative test of platelets, thrombocytopenia and acquired vascular disorders.
so next platelet count if we do platelet count so it it quantify quantifies the or it does quantification of platelet thrombocytopenia thrombocytosis okay the certain diseases where there is thrombocytosis but still the functional defect would be there then these two for bleeding disorders for coagulation disorders at least remember three important tests prothrombin time this is called as pt then partial thromboplastin time the pt then this is aptt may write it like aptt and then thrombin time so three investigations please remember for coagulation disorders for bleeding disorders first two and if you combine all these then these are the tests which are done to investigate a case of hemorrhagic diastasis is a bleeding disorder so prothrombin time why this is for evaluation of extrinsic pathway and common pathway so this detects the deficiency of 1 2 5 7 8 so extrinsic pathway prothrombin time so oral anticoagulant therapy many people would be on heparin or any other anticoagulant therapy the dic i told you i gave you an example of postpartum hemorrhage disseminated intravascular coagulation liver disease and then partial thromboplastin time so this evaluates intrinsic and common pathway okay deficiency 1 2 3 1 2 five common 1 2 five a common here then 8 9 10 11 12 So higher numbers, higher coagulation factors for partial from plastin time, and parenteral heparin therapy when the patient is on IV infusion heparin, DIC liver disease. It comes the same, but PT is for oral anticoagulant therapy. You know, when most of the people you see who have undergone cardiac surgery or who have thrombosis, they're all put on anticoagulants. So we have to monitor them by doing this test. Then thrombin time evaluates the common. pathway a fibrinogenemia dic and again parenteral heparin therapy it is prolonged so go back to this slide again just have a better idea about these days so prothrombin time is a normal uh, test that we do common test we do so it measures the effectiveness of extrinsic pathway okay pet if you want to remember prothrombin time whether it's for intrinsic and all that all of you have pets most of you have pets i don't say all or at least a pet lovers pet prothrombin time for extrinsic pathway okay don't get confused normal value is 10 to 15 seconds if it is more than 15 seconds then we say prothrombin time is prolonged what is the defect pet remember pet extrinsic pathway and common pathway okay so partial thromboplastin time this measures effectiveness of intrinsic pathway so mnemonic here is remember pit pit there pit here okay i don't think there is another mnemonic required to remember these two again so intrinsic pathway defect partial thromboplastin time is for intrinsic pathway defect normally is 25 to 40 if it is prolonged so we we'll know i told you the clotting factors i told you higher factors like 10 11 12 and all will be detected by this starting from 8 thrombin time this is the final one for the common pathway so this tells us about the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin a measure of the fibrinolytic pathway also normally it is 9 to 13 seconds okay so fibrinolytic system just a word about uh, this increased levels of circulating plasminogen activator are present in patients with hyperfibrinolysis what happens if lot of plasminogen activator is there the clot is formed but it gets lysed this is such a pathetic situation clot gets formed but it does not get stabilized that is lysed that is fibrinolytic system so there we estimate fibrinogen and then we look for fdp fdp stands for 
fibrin degradation product. Then all these are the tests. Uh, I don't think you need to remember this. Just go through this. Now, so what are the hemorrhagic disorders that are due to vascular hemorrhagic diathesis is due to vascular disorders? One is inherited vascular bleeding. So there are certain conditions where there is telangiectasia, no dilated vascular uh, channels. So one is a syndrome, ocular rendu weber syndrome. Then inherited disorders of connective tissue matrix. So remember Erlers Danlos syndrome, Morphan syndrome, pseudoxanthoma elastic. Pseudoxanthoma elasticum, see, if you just pull the skin, it just comes like elastic. You can keep pulling. Erlers Danlos syndrome. You must have seen a lot of videos and all that or in circles, you know, some of these individuals. So normally we can flex this, right? If you look at them, they can extend this also. So this, or you can say hyperextension. This joint, uh, probably we can do only flexion. So they will do total extension anyway. They can do all that. That's all an abnormality. So don't think, oh, what special they have. They have a disease that is Erlers Danlos syndrome. So much of a movement. This entire thing they can bend back. Okay. So that is hyperextension and all that they can do. So all these are vascular disorders due to collagen defect in the collagen. Then what are the acquired vascular bleeding disorders? So drugs, many a times we put them on certain medication and they immediately come with hemorrhagic spots. Steroids, you see, scurvy. What is scurvy? Caused by vitamin C deficiency. So vascular integrity is lost there, fragility. So henoch schonlin purpura and hemolytic uremic syndrome. Simple, easy bruising. Many a times we experience suddenly, will not know. So probably you sleep and get up in the morning or from morning, probably evening, you, somewhere you observe on the external aspect of your uh, legs or thighs and all that. You see a bluish spot there, bluish hemorrhagic spot. You get worried. You say, huh, what happened and all that. Suddenly something has happened. That's a devil's pinch. We call it as a devil's pinch. Don't get... Uh, you know, scare. It's just simple, easy bruising, probably. Or after exercise, you, you must have uh, seen, you know, somewhere on your legs or uh, thighs, a bluish mark. So it's just a capillary fragility, probably. The, uh, without our notice, the vascular uh, fragility has ruptured and caused a hemorrhage there, but it resolves. No worry. But we'll not know. No pain, nothing. Without uh, uh, anything happening to us, there's a hemorrhage. That's why we say, huh, what happened? Is it? Some devil's act or devil's pinch. Okay, these are acquired vascular bleeding disorders. Now, what do we see here? I'm showing you platelet def defect. This is how the bleeding is. Coagulation defect, it's the amount of bleeding is too much. So there's bleeding in the joint here. What do we call it as? We call it as hemarthrosis. Cisenyl purpura. This is also acquired one. Age old. Because the, of the vascular, the, the collagenization will, will not be there. Senile skin becomes more uh, elastic, right? So we can, uh, loses that elasticity. We can usually pull it apart more than how it happens in children or adults. So these are all tiny reddish spots that we see in old age. Okay. So I just want to talk about uh, two important diseases. One is hemophilia and uh, little about von Willebrand's disease because hemophilia is uh, uh, very commonly a short note topic for you. Before that, I use this terminology, henoch schondlin purpura. So this is an immune disorder which is seen in children and usually we say it follows infection, viral infection and uh, petit K with edema and itching. Okay, a child with viral infection is brought to the hospital and the mother says the child has got reddish spots on the body and uh, there may be swelling of the uh, limbs there and this is there is itching also so this is henoch lane purpura which is due to usually due to secondary to viral infection 
Okay, so typical symptoms and signs uh, just shown here. So there could be joint pain, and the child may say nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and all that. Some may complain of that or have that. Okay. So now hemorrhagic diathesis is due to platelet disorders. Why? So one is quantitative defect, the other is qualitative defect. So when there is splenomegaly, all the platelets get trapped in the spleen, so there may be hemorrhage. So ITP is one. ITP stands for immune thrombocytopenia or uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. So impaired platelet production. Where are platelets produced? Most of the platelets are produced in the bone marrow. Why am I showing here? Sternum. Okay. As age advances, it's it's all in the flat bone. Okay. So what happens? Bone marrow failure. There is aplastic anemia or some other cells growing in the bone marrow, as in case of leukemia, myelofibrosis. Entire bone marrow showing fibrosis. No, the hemopoietic cells producing the the. Then selective suppression of platelet uh, production because of probably the medication or the drugs that we use, especially quinine and rifampicin, anti-tuberculous drugs and anti-malarial drugs and alcohol intake also. Then accelerated platelet destruction. So platelets are destroyed; they produce, but they destroyed. I was telling you ITP. Remember, so acute. This is called as immunologic thrombocytopenia. Usually, they don't ask this as a short note, but still, uh, just remember one or two words, one or two sentences, or information about this. ITP is immunologic thrombocytopenia, thrombocytopenic purpura. This could be acute, a chronic, neonatal and post transfusion, uh, uh, isoimmune. So it could be drug induced or secondary to immune thrombocytopenia, like infections. SLE, AIDS, CLL, that is chronic lymphocytic leukemia lymphoma. Then we call it as secondary. Primary is idiopathic, where the cause is not known. So all these uh, diagnoses of this ITP is done by bone marrow aspiration. So bone marrow will show normal number of megakaryocytes. That they are the precursors from where the platelets are produced. But everything would be normal, but still the Platelets are decreased. That is ITP. Then increased consumption, as in DIC, TTP. You may just remember sequestration and dilutional loss, massive transfusion when it is given. Then there may be uh, pseudo thrombocytopenia. Like so, disorders of platelet function. There could be hereditary disorder or acquired disorders. Hereditary disorders are defective platelet adhesion. You may just remember Bernard Solier syndrome or von Willebrand. I'll tell you about von Willebrand's disease because most of puberty girls, you know, uh, they may present with uh, uh, excessive hemorrhage during uh, menstruation because excessive bleeding during menstruation because of von Willebrand. Then acquired is aspirin therapy. You must have seen many of the elderly individuals who are at home who are put on aspirin, you know, because of uh, um, either. Uh, uh, A disease related to their nervous system or cardiovascular disease. This is to prevent the platelet aggregation. They put on aspirin. That's why we say whenever you remember you want to take a patient, elderly patient, uh, for uh, tooth extraction or any of the surgeries. Please ask history whether the patient is taking aspirin or clopidogrel. There are so many other uh, drugs. So if they are taking, then you need to stop that. And then go for extraction. Otherwise, there will be excessive bleeding. Please remember this. So, one of our colleagues, you know, lost his uh, father when he was subjected to prostate surgery. You know, being a doctor, uh, you know, he really did not remember and and uh, told the surgeon that his dad is on uh, aspirin. So, after surgery or during surgery, also he bled so much. Whatever blood we could transfuse, also it did not save him. So these are simple things. Please remember. Okay. Then, so now we have come to the important uh, disease. This is classic hemophilia. Hemophilia is a coagulation disorder. Blood does not clot when it bleeds. Okay. So there are two types. One is hemophilia A. 
the other is hemophilia b classic hemophilia is hemophilia a and this is the second most common of hereditary coagulation disorders next to von willebrand's disease so which are the two important diseases under coagulation disorder hemophilia von willebrand this von willebrand is more common compared to hemophilia now so how is it this disorder is inherited as sex linked recessive trait okay so i'll tell you how is the inheritance but just remember this is a sex linked disorder and all sex linked disorders remember are x linked there are no y linked disorders we say only y linked is not a disorder many people you may a uh, few people you may see who have lot of hair coming out of the ear have you seen so that's a y linked uh, inheritance okay not a disorder inheritance okay so however occasional women okay there are uh, very few so this is all sex linked diseases are x linked right so hemophilia is a sex linked disorder uh, it is it affects males female is a carrier okay hemophilia a and b there are two types inherited so it is x linked female is a carrier male is a sufferer so april 17th is world hemophilia day uh, this is what in a lot of education we have karnataka hemophilia society the main uh, office being situated in davangere must have heard of dr suresh nagodi i'll just show you his picture so he is a pathology professor and he himself is suffering from uh, hemophilia and he is really doing a, a great service to people who are uh, hemophiliac okay otherwise the treatment is very very costly so dental patients the patients with no history of bleeding disorders normal laboratory results low risk moderate risk of patients who are on chronic anticoagulant i told you please take the history whenever they come to you okay so get even the prothrombin time done so find out whether they are taking aspirin their own aspirin or whether they are on any other anticoagulant therapy and high risk patients who come to you are patients with known bleeding disorders and then uh, patients without known bleeding disorders who have abnormal laboratory so before any procedure i tell you please get a pt done prothrombin time done okay i have not told you about clotting time because it is so non specific and useless test at least get uh, uh, platelet count bleeding time and prothrombin time done okay this is uh, coagulation so what happens how the blood clot the coagulation cascade so we are talking about hemophilia right so the chances of a proven carrier mother passing on the abnormality to her children is 50 50 so we'll see how it gets inherited x linked right so where is this x in the female okay so now we have a father who is normal who gets married to a lady who is a carrier that means she has a xx chromosome and one x is abnormal if both are abnormal then she becomes a diseased individual okay very rare so one abnormal gene she has now what is the chance of her son getting the disease and her daughter becoming a carrier the 50% i told you so one two three four is just take an example of uh, 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 four children here so one could be a normal male born without receiving this abnormal gene he receives normal so the other boy gets the abnormal gene then he becomes diseased he suffers from hemophilia now we have one daughter who does not become a carrier because she's got x which is always healthy from father but here there are two chromosomes x x so she receives a normal x and there is one more who becomes a carrier so there's always a 50% chance of daughters becoming carriers 50% chance of uh, sons becoming the patients suffering from hemophilia so there is prenatal 
testing genetic counseling that is done this is the only condition where female feticide is allowed okay if we find that female becomes a carrier so the disease has been known since ancient times and uh, this is called as a disease of the royal family because you know the royal family had this disease so hemophilia a and b i told you now you should know what is the deficiency hemophilia a is classic hemophilia this is due to disorder or defective or deficiency of factor 8 what what is this factor 8 it's a coagulation factor 8 deficiency then hemophilia b is called as christmas disease because the factor is called as christmas factor this is when the factor 9 is deficient when factor 9 is deficient so hemophilia a and b so you know the causes now what is the pathogenesis a is caused by quantitative reduction in factor 8 in 90% of the cases and 10% it could be factor could be normal or increased but still they have the reduced activity of the factor then factor 8 it is synthesized in the hepatic parenchymal cell the liver synthesizes this and it regulates the activation of factor 10 and the intrinsic coagulation pathway then factor 8 circulates in the blood complex to another large protein called as von willebrand factor so this comprises 899% of factor 8 the the genetic coding synthesis of von willebrand factor are different from those of factor 8 so normal hemostasis requires 20 at least 25% of activity of factor 8 should be there to stop bleeding or uh, uh, to be normal otherwise there's lot of bleeding though occasional patients with 25% factor may develop bleeding most symptomatic hemophiliacs have the factors below 5% so this is i told you when victoria see how their entire family tree they suffered from hemophilia so this is uh, severity this is percentage for uh, factor 9 is given but there i told you up to 5% or less than 5% to classify them as mild moderate severe then how do these patients how do we know that these uh, people are uh, suffering from hemophilia the child was brought to dr uh, suresh anagwadi this child was uh, hit by the teacher in the school you no know, do we say now uh, teacher should not physically abuse children but still this happens or parents may hit them on their head or hit them on uh, their cheeks and all that so just one injury the child you know had bled so much and another incident where just a child uh, fell down and then injured the knees and it came with such a big uh, swelling of the knee so much of blood lost what happens there about half liter or 1 liter of blood gets collected internal injury wherever suddenly there is so we talk about hemostasis here and homeostasis to so the blood volume and all so how uh, it causes so patient suffer from bleeding for hours or days after the injury and whatever should happen to that area with so much of blood so that has to heal right it takes a longer uh, time and when especially when they bleed in the joints so all this blood has to be uh, lies that should be hemolysis absorption and all that finally ultimately it leads to disability you know these people cannot move their uh, joints and many of them have this uh, limping and all that when they have uh, bled in the uh, hip joint that's why dr suresh is trying so much you know to uh, rehabilitate these patients and then put them for physiotherapy and then then psychological uh, trauma so much so counseling them and all that and getting them the factors so one such bleed then what is the treatment factor 8 is not this we have to give factor 8 to them where will you get factor from it is so difficult he has to get it from abroad so now factor 8 is available and uh, he has struggled to see that every district hospital gets it and who has to give that how the transfusion has to be done infusion you know for that and it's such a costly affair the so one bleeding 
patients have to spend about 50 60 70 000 and all this so who can afford to spend so much so once you all come back just make a short visit uh, to karnataka hemophilia society which is uh, the in nijalingappal layout okay just next to there is a shardamba temple there next to it okay so hemophilic bleeding can involve any organ but occurs commonly as recurrent painful hemarthrosis joint bleeding hematomas sometimes they say passing of you uh, blood in the urine hematuria and spontaneous intracranial spontaneous bleeding also could occur okay this is hemarthrosis intracranial hemorrhage this is muscle uh, bleed so these are the symptoms what i told you just a picture depicting that so laboratory findings what do we do so we do a bleeding blood coagulation time clotting time i told you is non specific test but it is prolonged then prothrombin time is normal because the factor involved is age so age comes under extrinsic pathway prothrombin time is fed for extrinsic uh, 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 prothrombin time sorry is uh, fed that is that is normal this is intrinsic pathway pitt so this is prolonged and then factor assay when we do it is lower so diagnosis of female carriers is made by activity of factor 8 then treatment is giving uh, this factor 8 so that's about hemophilia a or the classical hemophilia with factor 8 deficiency christmas disease is hemophilia b that is factor 9 deficiency inherited deficiency of factor 9 christmas factor or plasma thromboplastin component so b is rarer than hemophilia a and its estimated incidence is 1 in 1 lakh male birth so inheritance pattern of 9 are indistinguishable from those of classic so many a times we will not know it's only after uh, estimating the factor 8 in the laboratory we will know it belongs to hemophilia b then factor 9 has to be given okay the usual screening test is similar to classic hemophilia but here we do factor 9 as say okay so hemophilia now you know is an inherited disorder x linked recessive so male is a sufferer female is a carrier so how they present and what are the tests that have to be done so aptt is prolonged coagulation time is prolonged pt is normal factor when we assess how much of factor is there then we know that it is deficient so another disease you should do that's a short note for you hemophilia please remember von willebrand's disease this is the most common hereditary coagulation disorder due to quantitative uh or qualitative defect in von willebrand factor so as the name indicates okay it's a von willebrand factor that is deficient or not active estimated incidence is 1 in 1000 individuals that's why we said von willebrand disease is more common than hemophilia so it can affect both the sexes whereas there it is male who is affected von willebrand factor comprises larger portion of factor 8 and von willebrand complex though two components circulate together as a unit and uh, perform the important function of uh, function of clotting and facilitate platelet adhesion to subendothelial collagen so this von willebrand factor differs from eight in the following aspect so what are the differences so the gene for von willebrand factor is on 12 the gene for factor 8 is on x this is autosome this is x chromosome right then von willebrand factor is inherited as autosomal dominant so here it is sex linked recessive von willebrand disease affects both sexes whereas hemophilia affects only male von willebrand factor is synthesized in the endothelial cells megakaryocyte platelets but factor 8 is synthesized in the liver main function of von willebrand factor is to facilitate adhesion of platelets to subendothelial collagen so whenever there is bleeding injury to the vessel then platelets go and plug there so here it is involved in activation of factor 10 that is a common pathway coagulation pathway so clinical features of von willebrand disease so there could be spontaneous bleeding from the mucous membranes they may come to you also 
they may say there is bleeding in the oral mucosa excessive bleeding from the wounds there are uh, and lot of people i was telling you puberty menorrhagia girls bleed more so we have to investigate type 1 disease is the most common it is just mild to moderate decrease in plasma von willebrand factor then the synthesis of von willebrand factor is normal here but of its multimers is inhibited then type 2 is much less common again normal or near normal level of von willebrand factor but functionally it is not active type 3 is extremely rare this is the most severe form and these patients have no detectable von willebrand factor activity at all and bleeding episodes are treated with cryoprecipitate or factor 8 concentrate so when we do laboratory investigation of such patients von willebrand factor what do we see bleeding time is prolonged platelet count is normal and estimate the von willebrand factor so the level is less then there is defective aggregation with restocetin and reduced factor 8 activity so if all these are there then we classify we make a diagnosis of von willebrand disease so last i've just come to uh, talk about disseminated intravascular coagulation one example i told you postpartum hemorrhage really a pathetic situation to see this because uh, abruptio placenta abortion all these can lead to dic to activation of the coagulation cascade so it's also termed as defibrination syndrome or consumption coagulopathy it's a complex thrombohemorrhagic disorder occurring as a secondary complication of some systemic diseases even a amniotic fluid uh, embolism can cause this so pathophysiology what are all the causes for dic uh, tissue injury obstetric complications i'm just talking about that only because we see so many cases malignant neoplasms massive trauma burn surgery all these you know activate the tissue thromboplastin so extrinsic pathway and blood clots within the vessels normally it does not clot right remember the hemostatic mechanism then sepsis septicemia when the patient has septicemia even that causes tissue thromboplastin activity then endothelial injury certain conditions like acute glomerulonephritis severe burns hemolytic hemolytic uremic syndrome aortic aneurysm so all these act finally they all come to this they cause intravascular coagulation okay so initially the blood clots in all the in the body then later this is consumption coagulopathy all the platelets coagulation factors all are utilized later plasmin gets activated and there is fibrinolysis that starts so fibrin degradation products we see and all these inhibit platelet aggregation thrombin and all that so finally this leads to severe bleeding bleeding anywhere any organ you may see so how much ever you know blood we transfuse fat cells we give frozen plasma because it has got all the clotting factors and sometimes it becomes very very difficult for us to save the people so this is disseminated intravascular coagulation everything is prolonged clotting time is prolonged bleeding time is prolonged there is thrombocytopenia but all the tests we have seen you, know, you can see all these are prolonged and all the factors are reduced okay so that's about dic the this is only to say that please get involved we have uh, uh, such a nice unit working for uh, the welfare of hemophilia people Uh, i think uh, some of you must be knowing or uh, involved in this so let us uh, help people so this is dr uh, suresh hanagwadi this is meera hanagwadi so who knowing that dr suresh had this disease she got married to him and then both of them are really you know serving this people with hemophilia 
it's it's really you know we feel proud that uh, uh, one set of disease where people are benefited you know at least as a society to look after uh, their welfare this was hemophilia day when we celebrated you know so we were there so you have learned about uh, bleeding disorders coagulation disorders i've told you important aspects the investigations that need to be done to come to a conclusion so go back and read about hemophilia because that's a short note uh, topic for you most commonly asked and then uh, sometimes maybe one willy brand factor but when you practice remember these diseases and see that you ask history from elderly patients and then you get investigated at least minimal investigations to be done to rule out these bleeding the disorders so that the patient would not heavily bleed after a simple tooth extraction and you land up in trouble or patient we, we may sometimes lose the patient also for severe hemorrhage when you take him for a surgery without doing these investigations okay so i made this uh, topic very simple uh keep on listening to the lecture once with interest then go back and open the book so it it becomes like a review and then know all this not just for the purpose of exams but for uh, your practice also okay stay safe take care all the best